American what kind of issues do they think American literature contends with? And almost unanimously and without any hesitation, the students told me that they thought Americans were, were, were fat, um, were violent, were religious, and were patriotic. And you know, I just could feel myself sinking lower and lower in my chair. So I don't think I'm actually going to disabuse them of any of these notions because they're actually quite right about at least half the country, but at least I thought I could try to bring something a little bit nicer. Karen, what does teaching teach you when you do it, except off for offering a, a something, some money for a couple of um, Yeah, beyond, right, beyond just the, the dental insurance that we desperately need in our country, so, like a healthy smile, that's one thing. <laughs> Only, only, only Williams. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I, I would say that, that the students really do teach you so much. I think one of the exciting things about teaching beginning writers is they don't have all these preconceived notions of what a story is. So it can really extend your idea of what a story can do because they're just innovating. You know, they're, they're improv artists and they don't, a lot of times it can read like this strange word shark from their mind too. But I think it's, it's unmediated creativity and it's not, there's not the angst that comes later, you know, in graduate school or later when you've professionalized and you're thinking that, oh, I, I have to write, I don't know, I have to write a story I can publish so I can, I can support myself. There's a different freedom and they take different risks and I think that that is good to see. I feel like you're having both a Facebook and a Twitter account. I quoted from that. And for Karen Knopf is running a Facebook um, page. How important is social media for you as opposed to classic marketing? I Give loathe you. it. I absolutely loathe it. Why do you I'm do it? I'm very uncomfortable. Why do you do, you do I'm that? I'm on Facebook for professional reasons because it gets me work. I do a lot of freelancing. And um, mm -hmm. on Twitter, for a time, I was sort of engaged with the prospect of these kind of um, epigrammatic ways of expressing oneself, but my tweets say things like, Germany is German, so how, you know, how proficient am I in this medium? Not, not at all. Um, so I, I don't particularly like it. I mean, the one thing that, that I do find engaging about social media is that it gives me access to um, articles and events and things that are happening to which I would have no, maybe not so much no access, but I would just want to know anything about them. So people are tweeting articles that are engaging to me. Obviously, let the world curate for me what is of interest, and then I go and, and look at it. So I'm much more informed about what is happening around me as a result of Facebook and Twitter. But for my own personal glorification or self-promotion, I find it grotesque and debilitating and interesting. Have you already met some of your followers at your readings? I don't think I have followers. I mean, if you want to come, I mean, you know, you're following my Twitter account. I, I mean, hope, yes, people come as... I open a, a, a Twitter account in order to be followed. <laughs> um, people do, but I have more than followers are stalkers. And that is a whole different genre of fan. Um, and frequently they hail from foreign countries or parts of the United States to which I, or of which I've never heard. And, and those people will contact me with some alarming frequency. I'm really interested in this subject because, as, as speaking as a journalist, we can say that the readers of our print edition and our online readers do not overlap. There's only a very small percentage who are doing both of them. So I wonder whether the readers of your highly complex, sophisticated novels are really the ones who are following Facebook and Twitter. There may be a small amount of them, but I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm just curious, you know? I'm so, um, such a Luda and so kind of socially anxious just generally in the world that I think that dimension I can't even really enter into. Um, the Facebook page, it's a, but it's, it's now a standard thing. You can't opt out of it. You know, the publisher puts it up there. I don't know. I, that's such a good question. I often wonder that like with Amazon and these rating sites too, sort of, if the, those, those people are the same, if it's the same demographic that's buying, you know, the, the serious readers elsewhere. I'm really not sure. We're definitely in transition, I think. I mean, ebooks accounted for something like 30% of Little Brown's publishing last year, but we just don't know which 30%. Like, what are they reading on ebooks? I have no idea. I'm glad if anyone reads me in any way. If they want to read me on, like, the back of a cereal box, it's great. So I don't care. However, I can get to them. Both of you can take a story up to the point uh, where you wonder whether she's able to take the whole thing even one step further. How do you prevent uh, weirdness or outlandishness for its own sake? Well, that's a great question. I think that's always like a real challenge, you know, especially if you list in the direction of the strange. 
and I think that's something Fiona does just exquisitely, is ground all of her strangeness or weirdness or absurdity in these real human emotions. So I think in the section she read, there's an orca with glittery makeup, there's cage boxing, but I think that against that backdrop, you really feel the, the genuine, you know, loneliness, despair, alienation. Um, so I guess that's one antidote to having it feel just weird for weird's sake, is to have a real character with recognizable emotions. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think novelty is ever the answer to the problem of familiarity. You know, this is, you know, that's sort of like the crisis of the avant-garde is how do we make it new. I'm just going to say, I think Karen's actually, we'll just love each other a little bit here on stage. <laughs> I just read a story of Karen, I can't remember what it's called though, this is how lame I am, but um, these guys are dredging up those. Oh, the Karen's Oh my god, this story is amazing and it's so dark and it's so like the depictions of the natural world are really dark and grisly but and but they're not absurd but they are odd and then something happens at the end that takes it to this whole new dark place and the only way a story like that, I don't blow it and say what happens, escapes this kind of claim or criticism of just being completely absurd is that they're so, it's steeped in so much pathos and you know without the pathos do. You know who else is a master of this? Like George Saunders, I think, yeah. is a, one of my favorite American short story writers, and his stories are bad. Yeah. They're completely mad, but oh my god, they just break your heart every time. I think, yeah, if we did like our literary family tree, and this is one, one of the reasons I think we have such an affinity, is I'm sure Jim Shepard and George Saunders are both masters of this exact ratio. He taught you, right? Jim Shepard is Both of us. Both of us are I just drank in his house. <laughs> <laughs> just me. Okay. Yes. Um, but, they, but they both sort of walk that line. They'll have these fantastic premises with, you know, every theme park's ghosts. Mm -hmm. Jim Shepard does a story about Nazi hunters of the Yeti. Um, but it transcends that premise and becomes something that's universal and really um, genuinely frightening, you know, or, or genuinely emotional. It has become kind of a cliche to claim that from the, from the Sopranos to the Wire, from Six Feet Under to Breaking Bad TV series are hailed as the successors of the old novels and the ability to unfold an epic universe. Um, both of you seem to like to watch these series. I found them on Twitter again. <laughs> Great day, Madman, The Killing, whatever you want. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think, in which way is literature still up to these uh, narratives? What does it have to do? Oh, to compete with, to compete with HBO? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, even in terms of sophistication and may, maybe even the, the ability to shift from uh, drama to comedy within a second, mm -hmm. that's one of the mm -hmm. most astonishing things I think these, these, some of these series do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm a big Six Feet Under fan and I think that's a, a really darkly funny um, hybrid. It's a hybrid, sort of a genre mashup. Um, but I think fiction, you know, if you look back to Don Quixote, you know, we've been doing, we've, we've been doing that for centuries, too. So I, I think film, there's something, there's something the film does better, and there's sort of an interiority or a um, sonic pleasure, you know, there are different pleasures in a book. But I do think that there's a, there's a chain of influence, you know. HBO has options, like, every novel that's been written in the last three years, I think they're really interested in, in storytelling, you know, I think that the influence runs both ways. What about Smoglandia? I think HBO has adapted Smoglandia yeah. for the screen, but for the screen for the TV. Let's let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. As I mentioned, they seem to have options like every you know if they option you know like a hamburger wrap or like any literary product that came out last year. I think, um, but but hopefully it will be a series. This and it, I'll be curious to see what they do because they build it as a comedy. And when I wrote this book, it was it was very much a tragic comedy. So I'll see. We'll have to see kind of how they. Um, work out the ratio of humor and strangeness. So nothing's happened for the moment. They, they've contracted the writer for Parks and Recreation to do the pilot, so they're working on the pilot. But you know, Friends and The Corrections was supposed to be made into a mm -hmm. TV series for HBO, and then they nixed it because they thought that the book was too complicated. And you would never, that would never happen in the reverse. Like, no novelist would ever say, I mean, The Wire is an amazing series, but no novelist would ever say, The Wire's too complicated to novelize, and there's your difference right there. Is that you know, TV is is um, somehow opposed to nuance and right. and there's a the time you know there's there are these formal constraints like it has to be 30 minutes or an hour you know so and those kind of change the contours of what's possible 